Grace, peace, and mercy to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, we, uh, <clears throat> we begin a series today, uh, both in the uh, worship service, sermon series, and then also in our Bible study downstairs. Uh, by the way, you are also invited to stay and uh, head downstairs, 930 Bible study. We're going to take a look at some of these difficult topics. Um, the series that we're beginning is called Counterculture, and um, it's loosely based upon a book of the same name, written by a guy named David Platt. And the author describes something that we all know is true, right? He describes something that we know is true, but we just have trouble dealing with it. Uh, What what he describes is the fact that that our popular culture, the culture that we live in, uh, and the the culture is, you know, kind of a multi-layered thing, right? It's the way people think and the way they act, and it's it's about the music and the art and, and, and politics. It's all that kind of rolled together in different layers and, and it is our popular culture. And his point is this, is that popular culture that we live in is oftentimes very much opposed to and different than what God lays out for us to live and, and, and breathe and work and, and speak. Right? That the, something we know is true. Right? Culture is different than what God invites us to do. Uh, the culture that we live in is, is very different than the way God invites us to believe and to, and to trust. God says it this way. He says that you are in the world, culture, but you're not of the world. You are, you are godly. You are my people. And so God describes us as being not only uh, in the world and, and not of the world, but he also says that you are my disciples. You're my people. Right? You are a holy nation. You're a priesthood of believers. You are different. You are set apart. The problem that we have with all of that is how we, how we interact with culture. How do, we, um, how do we live in the world, but not have these worldly things overtake us and overcome us? Let me give you a couple of examples, first of all. When we, when we think of counterculture, maybe you think of you know, a small group of people that, that live differently, that are living against the establishment. Maybe you can even think of... Uh, you know, the 60s and 70s hippies counterculture kind of thing, or the 80s punk counterculture, or or these different groups of people that might live differently than society around them for, well, for various reasons. Sometimes just to be against authority. uh, Sometimes just to be unique and different to stand out from the crowd. But God's people have always been counterculture. God's chosen people have always been different. God invites us to be different. And, and, and here's a couple of examples of, of how we are different. First of all, it's something um, Pastor Verdell spoke of uh, when he talked about sometimes adults struggle with the idol of money. Right? The popular culture views money and possessions and prosperity and success. Culture views it one way. God actually views it a very different way. And yet we struggle right in the middle, right? We, we live in a world where culture sees money and possessions in some certain way, but then we struggle because we so that, that God sees it differently. And so how do, we, how do we live in both of those worlds? It seems like at times we have a, a foot planted in both places, a foot planted in popular culture and a foot planted in God's kingdom, and yet we don't quite know where we stand. That's not the only example, right? We have uh, a cultural view of of the value of people. And people kind of have a value placed on them by our culture. Some are more valuable, some are less valuable, depending on age, depending on ability. But yet God doesn't view people that way. Right? God's view of people is that every single one of his creation have a a great value because they're created in God's image. And so culture might have a different value placed upon people, but But God's way is that all people, regardless of their age or their ability, are are valuable to God. And so once again, we have one foot planted in both places, and we sometimes don't know exactly where we stand. Now, now the list of examples is long. It's not only money and wealth and prosperity and and the value of people, but God has a different view of of marriage. God has a different view of purity. God has a different view of, of sexuality than the popular culture might. Right? God has a different view of, of all kinds of things. The list is, is, is huge. Over the next um, several weeks, even well, as long as it takes, we're going to take a look at some of those topics to say, how is it that my view could become God's view instead of being kind of 
eased into this worldly view of things. For the purpose of, not pointing the finger at the world and blaming the world, right? but that the, the purpose of this is that we would, we would so know God's picture, God's view, we would so know God's word that we would be able to courageously and yet compassionately share God's word with people. People that might have a very different view than, than we do or than God does, but that we would courageously and yet compassionately be able to speak and act and live in the world, but not be of the world. That's our goal. That's our plan. In order to do that well, I think we first need to um, take a look at some of the ways that we interact with culture. And, uh, and, and this is important. I think this is quite valuable. Um, there's, a, there's several ways. The author of this book has kind of highlighted a couple of different ways. When I, when I go through these different ways that we interact with culture, I want you to kind of consider how do you interact with culture? And, and, and see if you can even see in the news or, or just in your own life. First of all, we... We sometimes conform. We sometimes conform to popular culture. Right? We, um, we, we see this happening in our own life when we begin to look new. Maybe we look at ourselves in the mirror and we discover that we're not the person that we really want to be. Or that God's called us to be. And we find that we conform to a way of thinking and acting that looks more like the world than, than like God. We even see that happening among churches and and fellow Christians. And maybe their motivation is is good. Maybe their motivation is that, you know what, if we we kind of aren't so old-fashioned, if we're not so uh, staunchly biblical, that maybe we can interact with other people. And so you see it happening in churches around our community, even around the world. Churches that would conform their view of marriage, churches that would conform their view of of money or wealth or or prosperity, churches and Christians that would conform their way of thinking, and it would be very different than God's way of thinking. Sometimes it is true that we conform to popular culture. The second one on the list is that sometimes we check out. The fact that we, uh, and maybe our church body would be accused of this at times. Maybe you would be accused of this at times. Meaning that you, you, you know people, you see people, maybe it's a neighbor or a friend or a co-worker, and you, and, and you see how they're living so differently than you, and, and instead of interacting with them, instead of listening or learning or, or having some opportunity to speak with them or, or share a different way with them, we just kind of check out. We say the world has changed way too fast. And because it's changed way too fast, we, we check out from the world and we kind of insulate ourselves from the culture outside. Maybe we insulate ourselves within the safety of our church, and we say, but everybody in here agrees with our way of thinking. They out there are the bad guys, so we're just gonna check out from culture. But here's what that does, is that the very people that God has called us to proclaim his gospel to are the very people that we've separated ourselves from. That God's always called his people to be counterculture, and he's always called his people to be a sent people to go out into the world so that we would share the message of Christ. And yet sometimes we, uh, we check out. The third one on the list is that we um, become combative. We kind of take up the fight. Maybe you see this happening, maybe to an extreme we see it happening on TV as, as um, those that would proclaim themselves to be Christians are carrying around banners and signs and they're telling everybody in the whole world that they're going to hell. Right? And so we, um, we combat popular culture. And so we come up against it in an antagonistic way. And we fight against other people that somehow we're going to convince them by berating them. Or convince them uh, somehow by telling them how wrong they are. Maybe the motivation is good. And that we want others to know God's way is different than their way. But the means by which we do it can sometimes be, well, combative, confrontational. And it would turn more people away from God and away from God's word than it would turn them towards God's word. Finally, we come to the last one, which is uh, this idea of countering culture. Uh, it's the author's way, I think it's a good way of saying that, you know, we, we do live differently. We're in the world, but not of the world. We do live differently. We have to do this in compassionate ways. We have to learn how to listen 
and watch and learn. We have to be able to uh, listen to other people and listen to the world around us, even our own family members, our children or our grandchildren that, that have such differing opinions than maybe we would see as, as outlined in Scripture. And so, yes, we do live differently, and yes, we do speak differently. We do it with great compassion, though. Courage and compassion so that we might proclaim God's way to a world that seems so different. So, so we go through these four, and we know that sometimes we have failed them. Um, the greatest example that we have is the example that was read a few moments ago uh, by Pastor. Right? He read that from Acts, and it was a description of Paul. Paul, this great missionary, uh, who was sent by God to go out into the world and to proclaim his way. And, and at times, Paul would go into places that would be so foreign and so different than God's way. Uh, you know, there was probably temptation that, that Paul would have to conform his ways. Or maybe there was a temptation for Paul to just check out. Or maybe there was a temptation for Paul to be antagonistic and to fight against. This example that we find today is none of those. I think what we find in this example today is one where he was countering culture in a very courageous and yet gentle way. Let me just rephrase the story in, in, in my own words just a bit. Um, you can read the full story just by opening up Acts at home later today, but here's how it goes. Right? Paul was there and he was proclaiming, he was speaking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those that were gathered around were, well, they, it was different but they were curious. And part of the culture of the day was that they would listen to other ways of thinking. And so they gave Paul an opportunity to speak. They, they, they brought him in among the high council and they said, um, tell us, tell us more about this. Well, Paul was wise. He was wise in that he spent some time learning the culture of the day. He understood the culture, and he understood how they were acting within that culture. And so he simply said, I, I've walked around today, and I've seen many altars, many idols. I've seen all of them. I see that you're very religious people. But I saw one, I saw one that was, that was proclaimed or built to an unknown God. This is the God that I'm going to speak to you now. The one that you unknowingly worship is the one that I'm going to teach you about. If you were to read on, he was, going to say, he was going to say this. This is the God of creation. It's the God that's made you in all things. He invites them to, to uh, turn from their sinful ways to repent. And he tells them once again about the resurrection of Jesus. That Jesus Christ lives. He's overcome death. And he gives them everlasting life. It says at the very end of that reading that some came to believe. They went from death to life. This is the mission that God has Paul on. It's the mission, by the way, that God has us on as well. And so we look around our lives and we see the different ways. Uh, we see the different ways of culture, right? We see how uh, money and wealth and prosperity and, and marriage and sexuality and purity and pornography. And we see all of these things in popular culture that just has become kind of normal. And then we look at our own lives and we see that sometimes we've conformed. <clears throat> we look in the mirror and maybe we look at our life, we look at our checkbook, we look at our computer screen, and we find that we have conformed to popular culture, and we are called to repent of that. Or maybe we look at our own life and we find that we <clears throat> have simply checked out. We say, I can just you know, be safe in my own circle I can live my life the way I want to live my life. Those people can live their life the way they want to live their life. And yet maybe we've even checked out to those that God has placed in our lives. Maybe we've even checked out from our family or our kids or our, our grandkids who are moving further and further away from Jesus Christ. But we can't check out. We've got to repent. Repent for the fact that we have checked out from the very people that God's called us to go and to help. Sometimes we've even found ourselves, we look and we find that we've become combative, antagonistic. Maybe others, well, we spoke the truth to them and they didn't, they didn't agree and so we don't long, they're not going to speak to us anymore again. Well, we repent of that too. God's way, God's word can't be proclaimed if we've become so antagonistic and combative that no one's going to speak to us about God ever again. 
As we come and we look in the mirror, we look at our own lives, we find our sin, our failure. And then we find something that is so countercultural, so otherworldly, so strange, so odd, so different. Right? We find that God, the God of creation, the God that has made you and me, the God that's created uh, the sun and the moon and the stars and the trees, the God of all creation did something so crazy, so absurd, so outrageous. Right, this God of creation came himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And he came to die for your sins and mine. He died for the times that we have uh, bought in and, and, and conformed to culture. He died for the times that we have become so combative or we've checked out. Right? He's died for all of our sins. It's something so countercultural, so counterintuitive, so something that is so otherworldly. But it is something that is absolutely true. Right? Your Savior, Jesus Christ, the God of all creation, has come to die for you and to give you new life. And he's not only given you eternal life, but did you hear me? He's given us a new life. He's given us a new life that we, we know we have eternity waiting through faith in Jesus Christ. We know we have a heaven that awaits us, but he's also given us a new life to live today. A new life to live today that we would not conform to, to culture. We would not fight back or become antagonistic. We would, we would not just check out. He's given us a new life so that we might courageously and compassionately not only live counterculture, but, but speak and love and care. Kind of like Paul gives us the example today in Acts. So that others might come to know the same Savior that we worship today. The same Savior that gives eternal life and new life. I pray that God would do that even over the next several weeks, months, whatever it takes, uh, as we take a look at some of these very difficult topics, that God would uh, not only just allow us to point the finger and look at how the world has changed, but that God would also allow us to see how he saved us. He's forgiven us. And by God's grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, gives us life and new life. Amen.